Josie. Okay, and you're seeing the right screen? Out of the way. Doesn't let me get it out of the way. Is that going to be in your way? Okay. Not at all. Thank you. Yep. One too many trips to see world in the flash there. That's right. There's bagels there. Hello. How are you doing? I am doing good. <laughs> doing good. <laughs> Sometimes it changes. I guess it's Saturday sometimes too. Yeah, it's a good thing. 
Start if you're going to run into the 11 o'clock class. Was it time? Cool. Because we have that other one that's in here at 11. Okay. Next time. Yeah, I'm ready to roll. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'm Darren with Fairway upstairs in the office. And as you probably saw Thursday, I'm not as good in front of people. So um, I'm going to turn all the time over to Skylar Whistle. He's with Continental Credit. And he'll give you the, the lowdown on credit and what he can and can't do. To help our clients get in faster because if they have some issues, obviously waiting too much longer to fix those issues with the house prices going up faster is uh, not good. They're not going to catch up too fast. So I'll turn this time over to Skyler and let him find the floor. Sweet. Thanks, Darren. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Uh, credit is, uh, be the first to admit, it's definitely in the top 20 sexiest subjects of the home buying process. Um, sandwiched right in between like title insurance and flood certs. Um, but credit is, I'll be the first to admit, my perspective is a little bit jaded, but I think your three digit credit score is more important than the last four year social um, because it impacts just about every aspect of your financial world. Um, as Darren mentioned, my name's Skylar Weitzel. Uh, I've got a pretty unique first and last name combination. It's one of the reasons why I'm really passionate about a really dry, not so exciting subject like credit repair. Um, but when I started working for Continental six years ago, um, I, I would say that my credit knowledge was pretty much on par with most of the people you meet throughout your daily business. I thought I had good credit because I paid my bills on time and I never had a car repossessed or been evicted from an apartment. So I figured my credit's got to be good, right? Um, little did I know that paying your bills on time is obviously a key piece of having good credit. Um, but I was unfortunately uh, a victim of identity fraud. Um, I have, uh, there's a woman named Kathy Woodward that lives in Nashville, Tennessee that was showing up on my credit report. Um, the only thing we have in common on paper is the first letter of our last name. I mean, most of the Skylers I meet are female anyway, um, which is cool because I've got this raging uh, ego to offset any sort of inferiority complex from my hippie parents giving me a girl's name. Um, but the only thing we have on, in common is the first letter of our last name. So why was this woman who lives halfway across the country showing up on my credit report. And I was my eyes were really open to the blaring inaccuracies and lack of accountability at the credit bureau level. Um, everybody knows the three credit bureaus, Experian, Equifax, TransUnion. Um, they're nothing more than data warehouses. Their job is to collect billions of data points, organize it cohesively, and then calculate that data to determine whether or not somebody's eligible for a $500 credit card up to a $500,000 mortgage. They've got two criteria that is basically like their make or break pass fail type grading system because they basically said, we handle too much information to be right all the time. Like that's literally their excuse. So I encourage all of you to tell that to your bosses this afternoon and I'll try and help you find a new job by the end of the week. Um, but they've said if the first five letters of a person's name matches up, they're going to merge that information at the credit bureau level. So if you're ever thinking of naming your son or daughter the same name as you or your spouse, it's a monumentally horrible idea. Um, unless your first name's George and your last name's Foreman, you will regret it and all the six George juniors. Um, kids love it because they get to piggyback on mom and dad's established credit. 
And then mom and dad hate it when junior misses a car payment and their credit is destroyed as a result of their kids being maybe not so responsible with their bills. Common names, I can almost excuse that mistake away. Because if you've got like John Smith Sr. and John Smith Jr. that both live at 123 Main Street here in Idaho Falls, I doubt that's a real address. And if John Smith lives there, then he's got really bad luck. Um, but you got a lot of commonality. You got the same last name, same address. Oftentimes, social security numbers were issued in the same state. So there's a lot of overlap there that I can almost justify away. The reason why Kathy was showing up on my credit report is because the bureaus have also said if seven of nine social security numbers match up, they're going to assume that's the same person as well. So sweet little old Kathy Woodward out in Nashville, Tennessee, her and I actually have the exact same first seven digits of our social. Um, if she had an 840 credit score and a 30 year mortgage and a couple of American Express cards in good standing, I would pretend I never found that out. And I'd just send her like a Christmas card every year, anonymously thanking her for being so responsible. Um, turns out, I'm pretty sure Kathy breaks out and hides when she pays bills on time. Um, they're, all of her stuff that she had accumulated was showing up on my credit report. And just to name a few of the highlights, she had two IRS tax liens, a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, a foreclosure, and more medical collections than I've had hot meals this year. And I was at a 550 credit score. Um, here I am, fat, dumb, and happy, thinking, yeah, my credit's great because I never miss my bills. For those of you that don't know how horrible a 550 is, it's definitely not something you brag about. Um, so I sent in a verification of identity, sent in a paycheck stub, copy my social security card and a recent utility bill. She was off my report in three weeks, went from a 560 to a 680. Usually I typically feel like one of the smartest people that God ever put on this earth. Um, I've never felt dumber than when I found out that I had spent most of my adult life letting this woman destroy my credit. I try not to think about how much more money it's cost me in credit card interest rates, auto loan interest rates, I don't know how in the hell I got a mortgage back in 2007 until it dawned on me who didn't get a mortgage back in 2007. Uh, but if you don't know what's on your credit report, you have no excuse of not knowing why. There are too many scoring sites out there. Your credit karmas, your my annual FICO, you can go straight to the bureaus and set up a consumer account and get your credit score. All I would warn you is <clears throat> there are over 55 different FICO scoring algorithms and I'll get into that in just a second. But when you check your credit online, all you're really looking for is to make sure all the data is accurate, to make sure all your credit cards are showing up and not somebody else's credit cards, to show that all your bills show that they're being paid on time and that you don't have a bunch of random inquiries from somebody who is not you that's applying for trade lines. Look at the content, take the scores with a grain of salt. Because what you'll find is that every different financial industry or institution is going to have slightly different criteria on how they judge risk analysis. And that's why credit is, I don't want to put on my tinfoil hat and sound like a crazy conspiracy theorist, but I think there's a lot of credibility to the idea that if big banks and corporations are able to keep consumers in the dark as far as how credit works, it's easier to manipulate somebody if you have them under your thumb. Um, you can never win the game if you don't know the rules. And if you don't know the rules, plus they're moving the goalpost, it's almost impossible to actually figure out what's on your report, let alone know how to fix it. So um, I'm going to dive right into this. I can't encourage this enough. Um, I sat through a lot of college lectures my freshman year and absolutely hated having one person talk the entire time. So I'm married. I've got two teenagers. I'm really not used to talking in complete sentences without getting interrupted. So if you have questions, don't wait for me to pause because I'll just keep rolling. All right. Um, uh, maybe I'll just keep rolling. There we go. A um, little bit of background on the company. Uh, we're not a mom and pop credit repair shop that just started doing this last year. Uh, we've been in business for 14 years. I've got over 200 employees back at the home office, which is in Denver, Colorado, home of the other Broncos that don't quite know how to win. Um, <clears throat> we have helped over half a million people. That's actually almost three quarters of a million people uh, to date get into a home <clears throat> that were initially denied when they applied for mortgage financing. So this stuff really does work. Um, there's a there's some pros and cons to being old and well established with a huge infrastructure. Just means that changes take a little bit longer. Whereas you know your mom and pop credit repair shop with just two or three people, they're a lot more fluid. They can kind of change with the with the times. But there's a couple things that really separate us from just about every other credit repair company in the country. 
we're licensed and bonded in all 50 states, which is kind of a big deal. Um, there's a lot of unlicensed credit repair that goes on, not just in Idaho, but nationwide. Uh, we're also the only credit repair company that has contracted with the credit bureaus to be able to pull our own tri-merge credit reports, which is really nice. Um, nobody's gone through that process, at least not that we know of. Um, took about a year and a half and a little over a million dollars rebuilding our CRM to adhere to the bureau's privacy guidelines. <clears throat> Equifax even made us tint the windows in our building just in case like Jason Bourne was in the adjacent building looking at social security numbers. Um, but we're, we've been doing this a long time and this stuff really does work. Um, Federal Trade Commission, uh, everybody's favorite uh, regulatory agency, um, estimates that 80% of credit reports have some type of detrimental error. So of the dozen of us here in this room, statistically, only about three or four of us have perfect error-free credit. At the risk of sounding like an ass, I know that I'm one of them. I'm not sure who the other two or three of you are, but if you're not 100% sure that it's you, you got no reason not to find out. So why are you different than Lexington Law Firm? Why, why are you different than what I do? I was a top sales agent for Lexington Law Firm for a lot of years, and I also have an extensive law and credit background in credit and credit repair. The only way to accurately remove something is if it's inaccurate on your credit. So what are you going to do different than I do? Lexington is leveraged seven times on their money. We know that because we looked into oh, yeah. buying them. That's why I walked away from them. Right, because you kept got got sick of getting paychecks that said uh, insufficient funds. Um, no, the, made a lot of no, I'm sure you did. Uh, Lexington disputes negative mm -hmm. items. Um, we go for deletions, not disputes. That's really the the signature difference is we're not contesting whether or not this derogatory item happened. We're asking for proof. So we're going within Fair Credit Reporting Act guidelines. Uh, we send out about 20,000 investigations every single day. Um, there's two, there, there are two different ways to challenge or correct items on a credit report. Disputing an item is basically saying, this isn't mine, please remove it. And there's plenty of credit repair companies that do that. We understand that, and like a lot of lenders will attest to, they typically can't close with dispute verbiage on a credit report. So we're, I, I, we're going for deleted items. Truth be told, I'm not really concerned if it was a legitimate derogatory item or if it's simply a reporting error. I'll be the first to admit there's a little bit of a moral gray area that we work within there because if we're getting a legitimate $5,000 medical collection removed, how is that benefiting the borrower? All we're teaching them is you can default on your debts and then we're going to get it cleaned up down the road. The reality is most people that don't pay their bills don't pay me. So it, I, I'm able to find out really easily and very quickly if it was an error and they're a good borrower, or if they're a degenerate and they keep getting new derogatories. The reason why I don't feel typically too bad about removing legitimate medical collections or legitimate car repossessions or legitimate home foreclosures is the minute the healthcare industry stops charging me 500 bucks for a Tylenol when I walk into the emergency room, I'll feel a little bit more hesitant to remove legitimate medical debt. When I see car dealerships not taking used cars for a $10,000 trade-in credit and then turning around and reselling them for 18 grand on the lot the next day, I'll feel a little bit more hesitant to remove legitimate car repossessions. When I see Wells Fargo not opening up fake credit card accounts for their borrowers and going through some really shady practices to go through foreclosures, I'll feel a little bit more hesitant about removing legitimate foreclosures. But my job, ultimately, is to figure out who's a talker and who's a doer. Because everybody will tell you to your face that they're willing to do whatever it takes to get into a home. I'll crawl to the edge of the earth over broken glass to fix my credit. And they sign up for credit repair tomorrow, and then they find out the new Jordans are coming out in August, and they're like, forget that 620, I got to have a fresh pair of kicks to walk around my apartment complex. And if you've never talked to one of those borrowers, welcome to the real estate industry, because you're going to get them if you don't have them already. So anybody can talk a good game. We want to figure out who's willing to put one foot in front of the other and actually correct the problem. That makes sense. If I would have known you worked for Lexington before, I would have probably bribed you before the meeting to make sure you didn't bring up Lexington. Um, we're, we're very familiar with Lexington. It's our biggest competition. But they also, last I checked, they either lock, lock clients into a six-month contract, um, sometimes longer. I'm not sure. Um, is it, there's no contract at all? No. Yeah. Um, well, then I guess I need to change that in my pitch. Um, I know that we're licensed and bonded. I'm not sure if they are. Uh, I know we pull our own credit reports, which I know they don't because the bureaus of us were the only ones that have gone through that process. Um, did that almost answer the question? Ish? Okay, I'll come back to it. Um, on average, 
we're not just here to look pretty and talk about how great we are. We actually see deletions. Uh, I've got thousands of client references that are more than happy to talk about their experience with us. I've got tens of thousands of lenders that we work with throughout the country that'll tell you that they've closed loans for people that were dead on arrival when they first had their credit pulled. Um, on average, we see the score go up between 20 and 25 points a month. Obviously, that's from getting around six deletions, roughly two per bureau. Um, so we're all about cleaning up negative information, but we're also here to help coach clients on how credit actually works, helping explain the gray areas between should, how do I use my credit card? Should I not use my credit card? Should I pay them off at the end of the month? What's the best balance to increase my score? So we really cover not just the bad stuff, but also the good stuff. Um, I mentioned, I touched on this earlier, but there's two very distinct reasons why you'll see such varying scores from bureau to bureau. Um, obviously there's three bureaus and three different scores, but there's two specific reasons why you'll see such a variance. Anybody want to take a stab as to why you'll see such a discrepancy from bureau to bureau? They have their own ranking system, so it's their own, it's not the same type of number for each. Correct. They, each, each bureau calculates data differently. Um, you, so you've got algorithms. Um, FICO has created 55 different algorithms for risk analysis. Um, car, in, car insurance is going to use a different scoring algorithm than a car finance company. A uh, mortgage company is going to use a different scoring algorithm than a credit card company. Uh, Direct TV is going to use a different algorithm than CenturyLink or whoever you use for internet. So you've got 55 different formulas mm -hmm. and every industry is going to look at those differently. Um, it, when people ask me what my credit score is, I typically like to answer questions with questions because it's a great way to keep conversation flowing. Um, it depends on who wants to know. Because if I apply for a mortgage, a credit card, a car loan, and an insurance policy today, I'm going to get four different credit scores. And that kind of makes sense because Wells Fargo should have a much higher risk analysis on giving me a half million dollar mortgage compared to Capital One giving me a $500 credit card. If I default on the $500 credit card from Capital One, that's like one less Samuel Jackson commercial we see on TV every day. If I default on a half million dollar mortgage with Wells Fargo, they just have to go and create a couple thousand fake credit card accounts to recoup their losses. So everybody's going to have a different view of, of whether or not I'm worthy. So you've got different algorithms that calculate different data differently, but then you've also got companies that don't report every data point. Um, it, mortgages, credit cards, and auto loans, typically if you've borrowed money from somebody or if you're financing a product or a service, they are more than likely going to report all, all information, good and bad, to all three bureaus every single month. That's referred to as a positive reporting contract. A lot, of, a lot of people don't know this, but when I pay my mortgage payment, Wells Fargo actually has to pay money to each of the bureaus to give me that positive payment check mark. When I pay my internet service provider or when I pay AT&T $400 a month for air, they have what's called a, a negative reporting contract. They don't, re I've been with AT&T for ever, like since before they switched to Singular and then back to AT&T again, there's no indication of me being an AT&T customer on my credit report because they're only going to report me if I go three or four months delinquent and they close out my account and send me to collections. So if there's no kind of financial skin in the game, oftentimes those companies are not going to report because there's really nothing for them to lose. Like your utility company, your internet service provider, your cell phone company, your car insurance company, they're typically not going to report because they don't have any financial incentive to do so. They're only going to report you if you starve them for 90, 120 days and they close out your account and send you to collections. So positive reporting contract reports everything. Negative reporting contract only reports when the relationship is severed. Um, best kind of real world example I can give, my wife and I have been married for 20 years. Positive reporting contract. Like she remembers everything. Good, bad, indifferent, with total digital recall. It's almost freakish. Um, my son, he's 17. He will be a senior in high school. He's had three girlfriends this year. The only thing I knew about those relationships were the girl's name. Um, and the only reason I found out the name is when they broke up and he was heartbroken for like five minutes before he found a new girlfriend. So positive contracts report everything. Negative contracts only report the breakup. If you've got teenagers, that analogy probably makes really good sense. Um, so you've got companies that will report everything and some companies that aren't incentivized to report anything unless it's really bad. I could skip AT&T's payment for two or three months and they're gonna give me a 20 or $30 late fee. They're never gonna report me to the bureaus until they send me to collections. Why is that so important? 
at least once a week, I've got a client that will call me, not the same client, but I get clients that call me and say, look, Sky, I've got 300 bucks to my name. I owe Verizon 200 and my minimum payment to Capital One is 150. I should pay Verizon, right? Because I can't live without my cell phone. I can almost hear them nodding their head over the phone, like waiting for affirmation. Forget Verizon. They can go kick rocks for a month. Always pay the bills that are going to report because you can, you can do a pay, to, pay for deletion with that collection. You can remove a collection a lot more quickly and effectively than you can remove a late payment on a credit card. And there's no worse way to destroy your credit other than missing your mortgage payment. Mortgage lates and credit card lates are the two fastest ways to screw up your credit. And it can often take months or even years to overcome those derogatories. Um, <clears throat> so any questions on the different scoring? Cool, you guys are experts already. Um, four industries that use credit scoring for risk analysis, obviously the mortgage industry. Uh, then you've got the credit card industry, um, insurance industry, and then everybody's new personal favorite, or at least mine, uh, the online industry. How many people have Credit Karma on their phone? Credit Karma. Credit Karma, the app. All right. Um, credit Karma is probably one of the most popular online scoring sites out there because they spend millions of dollars a year advertising. Like you can't watch TV for a day without seeing a few Credit Karma commercials. Um, they're a, a great lead generation website. Um, maybe not so much at educating consumers on how credit actually works. Um, credit Karma uses one of the one of those 55 algorithms called Vantage 3.0, uh, which is a really, really extra forgiving, super watered down, feel good about yourself type of algorithm. Um, credit Karma doesn't count derogatory items that are older than 12 months old into their scoring formula. It shows you everything on the report, but if it's older than 12 months old, they're not going to feed that negative data into the scoring algorithm, which is why most credit karma scores are inflated, what, 40, 60 points above the mortgage mid score. Um, but if you want to feel really good about yourself, credit karma will definitely do that. Um, they're just not very transparent when it comes to explaining to people how their scores actually work. Credit karma is doing the equivalent of me coming in here telling all of you that I was a straight A student in college. And if any of you believe that a traveling salesperson had straight A's in college, I'm about to sell you something, so watch out. Um, yes? So there, because I use it because I was on the picture of Texas, mm -hmm. so you know, capital one, mm -hmm. like wise one, mm -hmm. and I jump back and forth to make sure, so is the information on that not correct? The information, I'm sure the information is correct. Okay. It's just they're using a different algorithm to create a score. So and it, actually, I, I use the score as like an early warning system. If I see the score go up or down significantly, that's just a big red flag that I need to pull an actual report and see what's going on. So just take the scores with a grain of salt. Um, moving right along, <clears throat> I put out flyers and cards over there by the bagels. So if you guys want to grab one of these flyers on your way out, you're more than welcome to. Um, but this is basically when people ask, how is my credit score calculated? This is how. Um, this is the best visual representation of how an overall score is calculated. Um, obviously, payment history is a big piece of the pie. If you pay your bills on time, it's going to help you. If you don't pay your bills on time, it's going to hurt you a lot. Uh, but anything good and bad you've ever done since you became an adult is going to be found in that payment history section. Um, the reason why that's enlarged is not because it's the biggest section, but that's where most credit repair companies live. All they're trying to do is clean up negative items. It's the equivalent of putting lipstick on a pig, for lack of a better term. The way we look at it, if all we did was clean up derogatory items and we don't try and figure out the root of what caused those items, we're actually doing more of a disservice to the clients than creating value. Um, anybody can clean up derogatory items, but it does, no, it does no lender, no agent, and no borrower any good to go and clean them up magically over three to six months without figuring out what caused them to have screwed up credit to begin with. So we want to help educate them on how credit actually works because most clients are with me for about five months they're going to carry that score with them for the rest of their life so i want them to have at least a foundation of knowledge that they can build upon moving forward so debt utilization is all about credit cards everybody in here have at least one credit card please say yes anybody in here have more than five credit cards anybody in here have more than 10 credit cards anybody in here feel like if there's a department store out there you have a card for it because that's my wife's story. Um, I've got two credit cards. My wife has about 20. Um, there's really no wrong number of credit cards to carry except zero. Despite what Dave Ramsey might tell you, having zero credit cards, it will basically means you're foregoing 60 to 80 points out of your credit score. 
Um, I see this a lot with, uh, I've got a Spanish speaking team back at the home office. A lot of my Spanish speaking clients, they don't have bad credit as much as they have no credit at all. Um, like their whole credit report is two pages. And the only reason there's even a score is because they financed a used car five years ago. Um, we can help anybody establish uh, revolving credit. Um, having cre getting, you get points from credit cards by having them and using them. So we don't just want to tell somebody, go get a credit card and use it once a month for gas or lunch and pay it off at the end of the month. Because even though I don't talk to my clients like my kids, sometimes I feel like they're kind of on the same mental playing field. Um, if I gave my youngest the keys and the credit card and said, Dylan, go get $20 worth of gas, he will Snapchat all of his friends to show up at the gas station because he's rolling with dad's credit card. He will buy $800 worth of gas, $100 worth of Red Bull, a few hundred dollars worth of beef jerky. He'll tap some guy on the shoulder outside to buy him scratchers. I mean, he's a great kid, but he knows dad makes good money and doesn't usually look at the credit card bill, so he just does what he does. Um, I don't tell clients to use the credit card for gas or lunch because I assume that the first day a junior bacon cheeseburger from Wendy's will be fine, but the next month they need like a 30 ounce prime rib. So what I tell clients is get a secured credit card. We've got two credit card sites that we send clients to. Uh, one of them is First Premier Credit Cards. The other one is Open Sky Credit Cards. We, we recommend either or. I, I tend to prefer Open Sky just because it has my nickname and their web address, so I figured they can't be all bad. Um, but they don't pull credit, so you're guaranteed to be approved. No matter how bad or invisible your credit score is, they don't pull credit, so you're guaranteed to get approved through Open Sky. You only need a $200 load amount to get the card set up and they report to all three credit bureaus. So it really hits all of the action items on our checklist. There's actually some local credit unions in Idaho that offer secured credit cards for their members that only report to two of the three credit bureaus. So what's the point in getting a credit card if you're only gonna get two thirds of the value? Um, having the credit card is key, using it is where you get your points. So what I've instructed my team, uh, more often than not, when, we, when we're advising a client to get a secured credit card, we typically tell them to get the credit card and then call us when it shows up. If they don't call in a week, then I know they didn't get the credit card. But when they call, I'm gonna say, okay, you got a $200 limit. What bill do you pay every month that you will never skip? What's the one thing that you will forego eating dinner to make sure you pay blank bill? And for most people, it's like Netflix or Spotify or some sort of cheap monthly subscription. Perfect. Put your Netflix bill on your secured credit card and then go shred the credit card. You can't get in trouble. You can't shoot yourself in the foot if you leave your gun at home, um, basically. So I'm not only trying to educate them, I'm also trying to prevent future mistakes, which is really half the battle. Oftentimes people with bad credit, they need a little bit of extra hand holding. So that's really where we try and go above and beyond. Um, what's the best, if you got a thousand dollar limit on your credit card, what's the absolute best balance in order to optimize your score fully? Not, not a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. We're getting close. A lot of people, 30% is kind of like the industry standard. Um, truth be told, 10% is actually where you're going to get the full optimization of points. Um, I think the reason why 30% is so common is because if you can get to 30% of your limit, you're definitely tracking in the right direction. Um, it's tough to tell somebody who has a Discover card that's maxed out for $10,000 to pay that bill $9,000 to get it down to a $1,000 balance. Not that paying seven grand is a whole hell of a lot easier, but it's a lot less, it doesn't seem quite as overwhelming. If you've got one credit card and you use that throughout the month, you're probably gonna see your score fluctuate depending upon how you're utilizing that card at that given time. If you've got 30 credit cards, nothing wrong with that, you're just diluting your per card value. Um, I've got two credit cards, I've got a $500 Lowe's card. Um, I go to Lowe's because I'm a homeowner that thinks he knows how to do stuff on his house. Home Depot is actually for contractors. Um, and I've got a $500 limit with Lowe's. They keep asking me to increase the limit and I keep telling them no because I'm smart enough at least to realize that if I'm spending more than 500 bucks at Lowe's, I'm gonna end up in urgent care. Um, just, and then I'm gonna still have to hire a contractor. Um, and then I've got a $25,000 Capital One card. And the only reason I keep a big limit is I've got a big ego. And when I'm in town back in Denver, I like to go out to, for dinner and drinks with my coworkers. And it's usually the person that's had like nine Patrons that decides to play credit card roulette when the bill shows up. If you haven't played credit card roulette, Good for you. I play all the time and I always get shot. So I, I carry a big limit just so I don't get turned down in front of my coworkers. I mentioned earlier, I got a big ego, right? Um, so 10% is the true sweet spot in order to optimize your credit score. What you carry your balances at throughout the day, week, and month doesn't really matter. It's really just a matter of how comfortable you are paying interest. But 
I can guarantee you before I go to, to get a refinance on my mortgage or buy a new car or get an insurance quote, I'm going to make my damn, do my damn best effort to get all those credit cards down to 10% in order to fully op optimize my score. Any questions on credit cards? Okay. This is where most people screw up. A lot of consumers think that credit cards are like a muscle. You have to break it down to build it up. Only they translate that as, well, my credit card's like an accordion. I got to stretch it out to its limit and then pay it off because what better way to show the creditors that I'm super responsible by going out and spending all their money and then paying it back with mine. And reality is you don't have to spend a lot of money on credit cards. You just have to pay them on time. Yes. I do have one credit card that I'd like to cancel and I'm scared if you've got other credit cards, you're probably not going to see a huge drop in your score. Um, it, it, basically, as long as that's not the oldest one, then you should be fine. And it sounds like you've got some other ones to offset that. But that's why people say don't ever close out a credit card is because you lose the payment history and the credit history that you've worked so hard to accumulate. If you've got 10 credit cards that have been open for 8 or 10 years, closing out even 2 or 3 of them is not really going to hurt you. It's actually probably better to close those out than it would be to go and open up a new one. Uh, because every time you open up a new credit card account, your length of credit history is that average is, is shrunk. Um, but it, what kind of card is it? It's, um, it's actually the first one I've ever had. Really? So it's my oldest. Okay. But um, it's got, so it's my only credit card that has an annual fee on it. Okay. And it's a pretty, like, long fee. Okay. So, and I try not to. They might, I mean, if you don't use it for, depending upon who the issuer is, if you don't use it for six months or a year, they'll place it in what's called an inactive status. And when they do that, it's basically taking it out of the scoring algorithm anyway. Um, if you'd like, I mean, I'd be happy to look at your report and just give you an honest analysis of whether or not this is the best thing for you. Because it, if it is your, literally your oldest card, unless you've got some other ones that are almost as old, then you might want to hold on to it. But we can talk about that later if you'd like. I'm happy to look at it. Um, but that leads me right into length of credit history, which is like the perfect segue. I swear we didn't talk about this earlier. It just worked out that way. Um, length of credit history is basically an average of all of your open trade lines divided by the number of trade lines. So if you've got two credit cards that are 10 years old, your length of credit history is 10 years, and then you open up a Kohl's card and your credit history is shrunk by a third, which is why it's so important that we tell people, look, don't get new inquiries. Every time you pull credit, it's going to cost you about four or five points. And if you pull credit four or five, six times within a six month time frame, it really starts throwing up red flags that you're kind of desperate to borrow money from anybody that will lend it to you. So try and keep inquiries, inquiries to a minimum. Um, <clears throat> the, when you pull your own credit, there's two different types of inquiries. There's hard inquiries and soft inquiries. Hard inquiries is when a lender is actually pulling your credit to determine whether or not you're worthy of borrowing money. A soft inquiry is when you pull your own credit. Nothing wrong with pulling your own credit. You can do it every day for a year if you'd like to. It's never going to hurt your score. You go to a mortgage lender, they pull your credit, it's going to cost you four points. Um, anybody in here, uh, you guys all familiar with the, the shopping window concept, how you can go to several different mortgage companies within a 14 or 30 day period, and it's only going to count as one inquiry. Um, I'm here to try and smash that myth as best as I can so you guys can start giving good information to your clients. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a, a, a scoring algorithm called NextGen, and their whole idea was, we should empower borrowers to be able to shop around at several different mortgage companies in order to get the best rate. The reality is that concept never came to fruition. Um, if you pull your credit from a mortgage lender and then go right down the street the same day and have another mortgage lender pull your credit, TransUnion allows a 45-day shopping window. So you can have 30 inquiries from mortgage companies in a 45-day time frame, and on the TransUnion report, it's only going to show up as one inquiry. Equifax and Experian do not have shopping windows. They never have. They never will. So if you're, if somebody's telling you, this is obviously more for Darren, maybe more so than the agents, but as consumers as well, there is no such thing as a shopping window. There's well, technically one third of that concept is true because TransUnion does allow a shopping window, but Equifax and Experian will ding you every single time you pull credit just as kind of a food for thought for later um, and especially for you if somebody tells you well i'm going to go shop for the best rate i typically try and encourage my lenders to use that as more of a closing opportunity as opposed to an opportunity to let them walk out of, the, of your office um, that last piece types of credit is really just you want to see a good diversification of trade lines you don't want to see somebody who has 10 credit cards and no car loans 
or four car loans and no credit cards. You just kind of want to see a good healthy mix of the different types of trade lines. Um, these are the items that we remove on a daily basis. Everything, that's everything that can hurt your score. Um, the reason why I put asterisks next to tax liens, bankruptcies, judgments, short sales, and foreclosures is because those are kind of big ticket items. They typically take a little bit longer to remove. I just don't want you walking out of here thinking we can remove a bankruptcy as quickly as we can in medical collection, but we remove them all the time. Um, we've got about 20,000 active clients at any given point during the month, so we'll probably get a few hundred bankruptcies removed today, a few hundred foreclosures. How we do it for, for all those items is the exact same. This is it. If you can't go to sleep tonight, Google Fair Credit Reporting Act, and you should be asleep before your Ambien kicks in. Um, Fair Credit Reporting Act basically states that every item on a credit report, by law, has to be accurate, complete, and verifiable. Can't contain any missing or erroneous information. So we hammer the hell out of the creditors and the collection companies asking for proof. Um, I hate associating myself with attorneys because I've yet to meet a good one, but that's kind of how we represent our clients in that I don't really care if you're guilty or innocent. I just want you to sit down, shut up, and let me do my job. And my job is to force the guy at the other table in the courtroom to provide evidence or a smoking gun of this derogatory information. And if they can't provide that information within 30 days, the item has to be deleted from the credit report. So medical collection, really simple. We play Fair Credit Reporting Act against HIPAA guidelines. It's kind of sneaky, but it's also really effective. But Fair Credit Reporting Act states that you have to tell me who the doctor is. HIPAA guidelines tell me you can't tell me who the doctor is. So I'm going to point two guns at the credit the collection company and say you can either keep violating Fair Credit Reporting Act by not telling me who the doctor is, or you can violate HIPAA by telling me who the doctor is. One of these triggers is getting pulled. You can't pick both. So medical collections are hands down our highest deleted item. We get those removed at about 95%. Um, but we go through the exact same process removing a small medical collection as we do removing a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Give me the proof. So first month, we typically ask for basic information. Give me the borrower's social, their legal name, and their mailing address. And then we wait 30 days. We ask for basic information because you'd be blown away at how many big multi-billion dollar corporations don't maintain accurate records for more than two years. Oftentimes they can't even, Wells Fargo can't even tell me the borrower's social security number. So we ask for basic stuff, assuming that we're going to catch them with their pants down. And 30 days later, the item is deleted. If they respond to the basic information, then we start peeling back layers of the onion and asking for more and more detailed, more and more specific information. Um, on a bankruptcy, for example, I'll ask for the original bankruptcy trustees package. I'll ask for the list of creditors. I'll ask for the discharge statement. I'll ask for everything because by law, they're supposed to be able to provide it. So if they can't give us the proof, the law says that item has to be deleted from the credit report. When, at the end of the day, oftentimes it becomes a war of attrition because we're getting paid to ask these questions and it's costing the creditor or collection company money to give us the answers. They don't want to pay a minimum wage employee to go digging up an old, uh, an original deed of trust on a mortgage that was originated back in 2010 when they could just go and create new mortgages and, 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 and help their bottom line. Doesn't make any sense to look backwards. Kind of like as salespeople, we make more money looking out the windshield than we do looking in the rear view. Um, same concept. These, these big creditors and collection companies are no different. They would rather bill somebody than prove that somebody owes the bill. Plain and simple. Um, this right here is kind of designed to scare the hell out of everybody uh, in a really nice and gentle way. Um, the difference between a 620 and a 720 credit score will cost you around $110 a month in car insurance premiums. It's almost as though the car insurance companies feel that if you've got, got bad credit, you're more inclined to run over little old ladies in a crosswalk. I said that at a meeting a few months ago and one of the agents pulled me aside afterwards and said, I've got really horrible credit and I ran over a little old lady in a crosswalk and I thought that's a really crappy coincidence. Um, but insurance companies spend millions of dollars and they've determined that there's a direct correlation between the higher the credit score, lower the frequency of claims being filed, whereas the lower the credit score, they will file claims up uh, for anything up to and including insurance fraud sometimes. Um, if you've got an 800 credit score and you get a scratch on your bumper on your Range Rover, you probably had the cash to fix it out of pocket. If you got a 550 credit score and you're still driving that same Range Rover at 19.5% interest because you think you're balling out of control, you probably don't have the cash to fix, to replace a missing gas cap, let alone fix a thousand dollar bumper uh, dent. So higher the credit score, lower your insurance costs. Um, if you're a two vehicle household, that's going to cost you around $2,600 a year. I don't care if you're with Progressive or Jake and State Farm, doesn't matter your insurance company, they're stealing from you. And 
$2,600 a year might not sound like a lot. And if $2,600 a year doesn't sound like a lot, then what are you doing working? Because you got more cash than you know what to do with. $2,600 is nothing to scoff at. But if you put that $2,600 into a low risk mutual fund that returns 7% interest annually, you're looking at about $180,000 over a 30 year mortgage that is being stolen from you just because of your credit. And that's just your car insurance. So $160,000 over 30 years, that's typically when I ask my clients, what do you make in a year? Divide 160 by your annual income and tell me, honestly, are you willing to work that many more years before you retire just because you're letting your car insurance company steal from you? Then we look into car loans, <clears throat> credit cards. If you have a 620, that's great. You can get into a conventional loan, but it's still going to cost you a fortune. And the way I look at it is like almost like the Liberty Scales. On one side is the money that's being stolen from you because you have less than perfect credit. On the other side is asset accumulation. If you've got a 580 or a 620 or a 650, you can't accumulate assets fast enough to overcome the money that's being stolen from you due to bad credit. It's just a, it's a matter of fact. So <clears throat> um, one of the statistics that is not up here, um, 30 years ago, the average home price in the United States was $30,000. Can you believe that? Like I wish we could go back in time and just buy up a crap load of real estate and then we'd be rich. Since that's like 90% of the millionaires in the US got there from real estate investing. Um, but <clears throat> 30 years ago, average home price was 30 grand. Today it's around 300,000 nationally. Um, if inflation continues at the same rate, and this is one thing that I don't like bringing politics into stuff like this, but it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. If you're a lock her up kind of person or a lock him up kind of person, doesn't really matter. We can all agree the government's gonna spend too much money. So we're gonna have inflation. Hopefully not like Venezuela inflation, but we're gonna have inflation. So they predict that 30 years from now, the average home price in the US is gonna be $4 million. If you can't buy a $300,000 home today, that's what it's gonna cost you 30 years from now when you don't have that house to sell. So credit is cri critical, and if you don't have perfect credit, you're working too hard to not accumulate enough. And this is another reason why you should absolutely know what's on your credit report, because these are just a handful of companies that admit that their data has been hacked or compromised in the last 10 years. If you've never done business with any of these companies, then you're probably like Ted Kaczynski living in the Montana wilderness. Everybody has done business with every single one of those companies, whether you like it or not. Maybe you never shopped at Target because you were too sophisticated for that, so you went to Target. Um, like I said, I don't go to Home Depot. That's where contractors work, go. Um, I've never done business with Citibank because they came and spell city right. Um, but we've all done business with Equifax, whether you like it or not. They were hacked two years ago. 140 million consumers in the US had their data compromised. And the big one that I need to put up here, uh, about four months ago, Marriott revealed that they started to get hacked back in 2014, and they just admitted it six weeks ago, so obviously they were a little bit slow. Um, 500 million consumers globally had their personal information compromised when Marriott was hacked. Fortunately for me, my company doesn't put me up at Marriott, so I usually stay at like real classy places like Hampton Inns. Um, but these are just a handful of companies that admit that they probably use password for their server password. Um, Last but not least, really pricing can't be beat. If you don't have a referral from a realtor, a lender, or a current client, you'd pay 189 bucks. In the six years I've been with the company, I've seen four people pay full price, and one of them was the bully of mine from high school, so I just insisted on charging him full price because he was a prick. Um, <clears throat> and it was kind of nice to talk to him over the phone. I usually see him every four months when I go into Jiffy Lube for an oil change. But other than that, most everybody has a discount. Um, we don't market our company. You'll never see a pop-up ad for Continental Credit. You'll never hear us on the radio. You'll never see us in the newspaper. Our marketing is me traveling out here from Denver and doing classes like this. Um, every referral gets a hundred dollar discount. So they're going to pay $89 to start. That is per person. So if it's a married couple, it'd be 178 to start and then $79 per month with no contract. Um, most clients are with me for around four months, some more, some less kind of depends on what they need. Um, but as a company, we pride ourselves on not only fixing credit, but also returning loans to the people that referred them to us. And that really is, I guess, uh, one of the biggest differences between me and some other credit repair companies out there. If I get referrals from you and I don't produce results, you have no incentive to send me more business. If I get referrals and I filter out about half of the people that hire me should probably take their $89 and go buy Powerball tickets because they've got the same chance of winning the jackpot as they do winning at life. But the, the other half, those are the ones that we want to work with and those are the ones that you want to work with. Um, we're going to figure out who's good. 
And on average, we get about 35% of our clients back to the original referring partner. Um, we do updates every 30 days. So if you send me a client, you'll never be in the dark as to what's going on with them. Um, we can send you a copy of their credit report when they sign up. We'll also send you copies of future credit polls. Um, every client gets a credit poll when they sign up and then either 60 or 90 days in the program, depending upon how banged up they are. If somebody comes to me at a 500, I'm not gonna repull credit 60 days in because I don't wanna get them falsely excited over being at a 550 because they're still a ways away from buying a home. If somebody hires me at a 605 and they only need 15 points, I'll repop on them every two weeks if I have to. Because as soon as they're ready, I wanna make sure they're back in their mortgage lender's office getting approved. Um, other than that, I think that's about it. Any questions? Comments, concerns, criticisms, critiques? Anybody want to bust my butt about how we're different than Lexington? Anybody else, I mean? <laughs> uh, anybody ever tell you you look like the guy from West Coast Choppers? No. Okay. Are you the guy from West Coast Choppers? <laughs> yeah, I just like to hang out. That's cool. That's cool. Um, other than that, guys, um, grab a card, grab a flyer. Text and email is a great way to get a hold of me. You can try calling me, but I'm usually busy so text is a great way to get a hold of me um, if you haven't if you're not sure what's on your report or if you know what's on your report and you don't want to talk about it now I'd be happy to work with you I'd be happy to help you and when it all comes down to it at the end of the day we can help you sell more houses I just don't uh, hopefully now next time you meet somebody in an open house that tells you straight up hey I'm, I'm a year and a half out of bankruptcy I know I can't buy right now I just kind of want to see what's available that person is not a dead lead like they're just a lead that needs to be kind of hit with the chest paddles and put on life support for a few months and then we can get them back to you. Um, we'd rather just get our hands dirty and spend the time and energy cleaning them up. That way you can focus on people that are eligible now because there's nothing worse than spending six months with a client only to find out that they are their own worst enemy and you spent a few hundred dollars in gas driving them around to open houses and listings only to find out that their credit's so bad that they'd probably get turned down for a debit card. You don't have the luxury of spending time with them until they're ready. So that's what we're here for, is to get them ready and help separate the ones that will never be ready. So um, with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. If anybody wants that PowerPoint, I, mean, I can email the whole thing. If anybody needs it. Okay. That was really, really good. Awesome. What if I did it myself? What's that? What if I did it myself?